It's really a, uh, a great joy to, to introduce our, our next speaker. About a year and it might have been two years ago, I was speaking at an event uh, uh, for Missio Alliance in, in Virginia, Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, I was invited to, to speak on um, one of the issues pertaining to the church in the country. And at this event, uh, the first person to stand up and speak was uh, Mark Charles. And I had never heard Mark speak before. And as he spoke, I, I listened and thought, I got to bring this guy to Queens. Uh, I got to find a way to bring this guy to Queens. And so uh, Mark is the son of an American woman of Dutch heritage and a Navajo man. Mark speaks with uh, insight into the complexities of American history regarding race, culture, and faith in order to help forge a path of healing and conciliation for the nation. He serves as the Washington, D.C. correspondent and regular columnist for Native News Online and is the author of the popular blog Reflections from the Hogan, uh, which I really recommend you, you check out. Mark also consults with the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, has served as the pastor of the Christian Indian Center in Denver, Colorado, and is a founding partner of a national conference for Native students called uh, Would Jesus Eat Fry Bread? Uh, Mark is active on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and uh, he's under the handle just uh, Wireless Hogan. Uh, now, whenever someone comes and speaks at New Life, and whenever we welcome someone, we just don't give them like a little pitter-patter, like, oh, we're happy to see you here. We, we give people really warm ovations, letting them know we are thrilled that you're here and we're excited to learn from you. And whether that happens on a Sunday morning or whether that happens on a Friday afternoon like we're in right now, that's what we do here. And so you're in our house, and so uh, I'd, I'd like you to respond with a crazy Queens Boulevard welcome. Give it up for Mark Charles as it comes up. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> so yat eh? Yat eh? Mark Charles, you know, yeah. Sin bake de nair in this lint, the toy higlini basachin, sin bake de nair basache, the toy de chitni basanella. In the Navajo culture, when you introduce yourself, you always give your four clans. We're a matrilineal people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. And so my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and so I say, sin bake de nair in this lint, which translates into, I'm from the wooden shoe people. <laughs> my father's mother, my second clan, is toy higlini which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin Bekei Dene'a. And then my fourth clan, my father's father, is Toto Chitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. Before we go any further, I want to acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Rockaway and the Matin, Matin Ekok. These are the two tribes that lived in this part of the state. These were the tribes that hunted here, they fished here, they farmed here, their society was here, they had their children here, and they buried their dead here. These were also the tribes that were removed from these lands so that the city of New York and the state of New York could be built. And it is important that we acknowledge the people whose land we're standing on. Not only does this almost demand us to conduct ourselves with greater humility, but it also serves as a reminder that these lands were not discovered. Um, these lands were inhabited, and we need to remember these things. And so I honor the Rockaway and the Matanikok people for the hundreds, even thousands of years they've stewarded these lands. And I am honored and privileged to be here today on their lands. Um, before I go any further also, I want to just acknowledge I'm talking today and tomorrow about the doctrine of discovery. 
And while I have done a lot of research and I've been a part of many research teams and I'm writing a book with a, a good friend of mine named Sing Chan Ra on the Doctrine of Discovery, I am not the first one nor the only one who is doing this type of work. And there is one uh, a native academic, his name is Stephen Newcomb, he's Lenape and Shawnee, and he um, has written a book called Pagans in the Promised Land. And uh, he takes a very close look at kind of the legal um, implications of the doctrine of discovery. And he has been working for years, even decades, to bring this dialogue on the doctrine of discovery to the forefront. And so I just want to make sure it's very clear that um, while a lot of what I'm presenting today is things that I've looked at and researched, but there are many people who are trying to bring this dialogue to the forefront. And I am privileged to be standing with them. I am honored to be working alongside them. And uh, I am excited to see what happens and how Creator uses these moving forward. Two questions before we start. Have you ever asked yourself why the church in the US seems to be impotent when you ask it to deal with systemic, multi-generational and corporate sin? If the church can't wash your feet or pronounce individual forgiveness, it seems lost. It doesn't know what to do. If you kill your neighbor, if you commit adultery with your neighbor's wife, if you, if you steal from your brother or your sister and you go to the church, they will say, we can help you. There's this guy, Jesus, and he died for your sins. But if you go to the church and say, I want to deal with slavery and I want to deal with, with um, the sexism that's embedded in my community and in my nation and in my church, and I want to deal with the ethnic cleansing and the genocide of, of Indian removal and boarding schools, the church doesn't know what to do. And do you also wonder why we don't know whose land we're standing on? Why are we not aware of the tribes that lived here before? Why do we not know their names? Why do we not understand their languages? Why do we not know what, what was going on before Columbus got lost at sea? <laughs> well, there's a quote I wanna to read to you, and this is from Peter Burnett, who was the first governor of California, and this was in his first State of the State Address in 1851. And he said this, he said that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct, must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result, but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power or wisdom of man to avert. Now he's not talking about these Indians are going to die because of famine, which we can't control. And he's not saying they're going to die of disease, which is out of our control. He's saying we are waging a war of extinction and we can't stop. We can't stop killing these people until they're all gone. And that's regrettable, but there's, well, there's nothing we can do. What in the world makes a man say that? Especially a man who's a governor in a Christian nation. These are the questions we have to ask. These are, we're so angry, getting bitter about Trump or bitter about Hillary, we forget that we don't talk about the foundations of our country. And I tell people, you can't understand the foundations of the United States of America unless you understand the history of the church. So I want to take us all the way back to Jesus, okay? So Jesus comes into this world, and he's coming into a world that has some challenges. The people of Israel have a land covenant with the God of Abraham. 
And their land covenant uses their relationship to the land as a barometer of their relationship to God. And the barometer is one of prosperity. So when they're on their land and they're well-fed and they're secure and they're safe, they know their relationship with God is going good. When they're exiled from their land, when they're under oppression, when the crops aren't growing, when they're having famine, when their families are dying, they know something's wrong in their relationship with God. They have a barometer and they can find out their relationship with God where that stands by how they are prosperous prospering in their land or not prospering. And so at the time of Jesus' birth, the people of Israel were under the oppression of the Romans. Now, they were still on their lands by and large, but they were not able to worship freely, and they knew something was wrong. And so we have the sect of the Pharisees that's rising up that's saying, well, maybe if we keep the law of the priests, God will have mercy and send his Messiah and free us from our Roman oppressors and return us to the greatness of the kingdom of David. And so this is, the, this is the mentality Jesus was coming into. And so he was coming in where they were expecting a political Messiah, someone to set them free in military might. And so, yes, he came as the Messiah, but he tried to change expectations. So he, was, he, he came as the Messiah, but he was born in a barn. Angels announced his presence, but they were singing to shepherds. He grew up as a refugee in Egypt and came back and lived in the backwater town of Nazareth. And in his early ministry, Satan takes him to the top of a high mountain and gives him, that tempts him with what he assumes is the goal. He shows him the kingdoms of the world and says, if you bow down to me, I will give them to you. And Jesus rebukes him and walks away. One day he's out and he's with his disciples and there's 4,000 men, probably eight to 12,000 men, women, and children. And he's teaching and the people get hungry and so they find this kid and they shake him down. They grab his lunch and Jesus feeds everybody. And they're so excited that they come to make him king by force. But he didn't come to become king. So he walks away. One day he's out and he heals a widow's son, raises him from the dead. And he heals the servant of a centurion, a Roman centurion, the enemy. This so bewilders John the Baptist when he hears about it that he sends his disciples to Jesus and say, hey, are you the one we're waiting for or should we look for someone else? You are not the political Messiah we expected. Jesus turns around, heals more of the sick, casts out more demons, gives sight to more of the blind, hearing to more of the deaf, and says to John's disciples, go back and tell your master what you just saw. Blessed is the man who doesn't fall away on my account. He's rebuking John saying, this is what I'm doing. Get on board or get out of the way. One day he's coming out of a Samaritan village with James and John. They're probably under judgment because of the Samaritans. They've intermarried. They're not worshiping in the temple. They're worshiping on this mountain. The people of Israel are probably experiencing judgment from God because of the sin of the Samaritans. And so the Israelites hate the Samaritans. The disciples feel pretty good they've gone there in the first place. And then the Samaritans reject them. They reject the prophet. And so coming out, James and John are excited. They're like, cool. They've rejected us. Jesus, can we be the ones to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? Now, this isn't an outlandish request. This is what God does. When a nation sins, he sends a prophet. If people hear the prophet, he has mercy. If they reject the prophet, it's fire and brimstone. This is Sodom and Gomorrah. This is Jericho. This is why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Elijah called on fire from heaven three times. James and John are like, who doesn't want to call down fire from heaven? heaven? Like, would that be cool? And Jesus rebukes him. No, that's not what we're doing. And he sends them into another Samaritan village. And in Mark 8, Jesus is with his disciples, and he says, well, who do people think I am? Some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, others one of the prophets. Well, who do you think I am, he asked his disciples. And Peter says, you're the Messiah. Now, if the entire goal was to convince them he was the Messiah, job's done. He can ascend right now, and he's done his work. But he instead tells Peter not to say anything, And then he begins to teach him that the Son of Man, the Messiah, must suffer and die. This is so outlandish to Peter that he takes his own teacher aside and begins to rebuke him. And when Jesus 
sees the other disciples watching this scene, he turns and rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. You are not on the side of God, but of men. And then he begins to teach them that not only must the Messiah suffer and die, but anyone who comes after him must also be persecuted and suffer and die. See, Jesus is giving them a new barometer. The old barometer was this land covenant and prosperity in their land is how they gauge their relationship with God. And now he is giving them a new barometer, which is persecution. You will know if you are on the right path, not because you're well-fed and rich and your crops are growing, but because you are being persecuted. This is a brand new barometer and the disciples hate it. They rebel against it in every way, shape, and form. One day, Jesus is out with his disciples, and they see another man casting out demons in Jesus' name, and the disciples tell him to stop. And they tell Jesus, we saw this guy doing this, and we told him to stop because he wasn't one of us, the special ones. And Jesus not only says, don't stop him, but he says, If you dare create a category of other and cause one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better if you tied a millstone around your neck and jumped into the ocean. If your hand causes you to think you're better than someone else, cut it off because it's better to go with hell to hell lame than with two hands or better to go to heaven lame than with two hands to go to hell. If your eye causes you to think you're better than someone else, pluck it out because it's better to go to heaven blind than with two eyes to be sent into hell. He saves his most potent rebuke, not for the religious leaders, not for the tax collectors, not for the prostitutes, and not for the sinners, and not even for the Romans. He saves it for his disciples when they think somehow they're better than other people. And Jesus is adamant. His kingdom is not of this earth. He did not come to create a Christian empire. When he's in the garden... Peter still can't give up this vision of a Christian empire. And so the guards come, and Peter pulls out his sword and slashes off the guard's ear, and Jesus rebukes him, puts the sword away, and picks up the guy's ear and puts it back on. He's standing for Pilate, and Pilate's trying to get him to answer some questions. This is the perfect time. Pilate doesn't want to crucify him. This is the perfect time for Jesus to say, Pilate, for such a time as this, God has chosen you. You can save the Messiah. You are the, you are the man in charge. You have the authority. You can save the Messiah right here, right now. You have been chosen for such a time as this. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says, you don't have any authority over me. The only authority you have is what my Father in heaven gave you. My kingdom's not on this earth. If my kingdom were from here, my servants, the angels, not my disciples who I call friends, would come and save me. My kingdom is from somewhere else. And then he gets crucified alone. Because nobody wanted this new barometer. All of his disciples left. Everyone abandoned him. Everyone left him. He died on the cross alone, and even God turned his back. It wasn't until after he rose from the dead and then appeared to his disciples and ascended into heaven and then sent his Holy Spirit that the disciples got it. And then they acknowledged that we were the ones who killed Jesus. And when they were warned by the Romans 
to not, or by the chief priests and the leaders, to not talk about this name of Jesus anymore. They said, we don't know if it's right or wrong to do that, but we can't stop talking about what we've seen. And they finally embrace this new barometer, and almost all of the disciples go on to die a martyr's death. And so in the first through the third centuries, when you joined the church, you were joining a group of people who were standing in opposition to, first of all, institutionalized religion, and second, in opposition to the empire. And when you joined the church through your baptism, your confession, your discipleship, and your community, you know that you were standing in, in opposition to empire, and there was a good chance you would be persecuted and probably even killed because of your membership in this church. Now, in the fourth century, we have the creation of what is called Christendom. This is a heretical teaching of Christian empire. Now, if you're like me, you probably blame Christian empire all of your life on Constantine, right? He sees this vision, he converts, he becomes overzealous and Christianizes Rome and creates Christendom. Well, I used to think that too until this last summer as I'm finishing up my book and I'm, I'm, we're, we're trying to do this chapter and change the story and I decided I wanted to, to change one of the stories in the, first par- in the first chapter of the book and I wanted to include the, the vision of Constantine And so I began researching the vision and found it was recorded by the bishop of Caesarea called Eusebius, who was writing a book in the early 4th century called The Life of the Blessed Constantine. And prior to that book, he wrote another book called Ecclesiastical History. See, before this, there was not an institutionalized church. And Eusebius sent out to, set out to say, we need to record the history of the church. And so he begins with the life of Jesus and the, then the stoning of Stephen and begins to record the history of the church from the first century all the way up to the fourth century. This book is actually a volume of 11 books. The first few books establish the divinity of Christ. Books three through five or three through eight talk about the martyrs of the church, sometimes in bloody, gory detail. And then in um, book eight, he introduces Constinius, who is Constantine's father, who was one of the emperors who was not as ruthless in his persecution of the church. And he holds him up as an emperor chosen by God. And then he introduces Constantine, his son. And he talks about him in these glowing terms as an emperor chosen by God for such a time as this. And then between books eight and nine, he inserts a book called the, the, the Book of the Martyrs, 13 chapters of martyrs from the great persecution in 303 AD. This is some of the bloodiest persecution the church has ever seen. And many of the martyrs, it says he witnessed their martyrdom personally, and he knew most of them because it was taking place in, in Caesarea and in Palestine, where Eusebius was from. And then in books nine, he changes his thinking. And before he was talking about the martyrs who were dying with joy because they were sharing in the suffering of Christ. And after the book of the martyrs, he begins talking and focusing and almost obsessing with the emperors. And in book eight, he actually talks about a battle that Constantine won over Maxtinius, the battle at Milvane Bridge, and he compares Constantine's victory to Moses defeating Pharaoh at the Red Sea. And now, if you're writing a book called Ecclesiastical History, does your book have an ending? Is there a conclusion to your book? No, right? Because Ecclesiastical History won't end until Christ returns. But if you read the last chapter of book 10, you will see there absolutely is a conclusion. They celebrated with splendid and festive days the joy and hilarity. All things were filled with light and all who before them were sunk in sorrow beheld each other with smiling and cheerful faces. At the same time, they celebrated and extolled, first of all, God, the universal king, because thus they were taught. Then they celebrated, not Christ, but the praises of the pious emperor and with him all his divinely favored children. 
There was a perfect oblivion of past evils and past wickedness was buried in forgetfulness. There was nothing but enjoyment of the present blessings and expectations of those yet to come. The supreme God granted from heaven above the fruits of his piety, the trophies of victory over the wicked, and that narcissist tyrant with all his counselors and adherents. He cast prostrate not at the feet of Christ, but of Constantine. See, after the great persecution, Eusebius decided he didn't want to be persecuted. And so he saddled up to the most powerful emperor who had the most likely chance of ending the persecution. And he held him up as an emperor chosen by God for such a time as this. And Constantine bit. And they created Christian empire. And if you're going to have a Christian empire, because Jesus was absolutely opposed to it, the first thing you have to do is write Christ out of ecclesiastical history, which is exactly what Eusebius does in book 10, the last chapter of ecclesiastical history. He writes Christ out of the history of the church and inserts Constantine. And then he writes another book called The Life of the Blessed Emperor, Constantine. Chapter 4 is titled, How God Honored Constantine. Chapter 6 is titled, He Was the Servant of God and the Conqueror of Nations. Chapter 8 is titled, He Conquered Nearly the Whole World. Now, what did Satan promise Jesus if he would bow down to him? The whole world. Chapter 8 says, he received the submission of all rulers, governors, and satraps, and barbarous nations who cheerfully welcomed and saluted him. Constantine alone above all emperors was acknowledged and celebrated by everyone. Then he talks about how while he was praying, God sent him a vision of a cross with the inscription admonishing him to conquer by that cross. And then he sent him how God appeared to him in his sleep the Christ of God, and told him to use this standard in the form of a cross to win his victories. Now remember when Christ appeared to Saul on his way to Damascus, and Christ blinded Saul, and then sent him stumbling all the way to Damascus, and he sat there blind for a while, and then he sent Ananias to Saul, and he told Ananias, go and tell Saul what? What? how much prosperity he's going to have, how much victory he's going to have, how much defeat he's going to have. No, go tell him how much he must suffer on my account. Why did he say that? Because he was punishing Saul? No, because this is the new barometer. When you come after Jesus, when you follow Jesus, you pick up your cross and you suffer. And so he was giving Saul the same message he gave his disciples. So I don't know whose vision Constantine was of, but it wasn't Christ. The Jesus I know would not go to the most powerful emperor in the world and tell him how to win his wars. The Jesus I know would go to the most powerful emperor in the world and tell him to set aside things of the world and to pick up his cross and not to end the persecution, but to now endure it as he pursues after Christ. But that's not the line that Eusebius fed Constantine and that's not the conversion that Constantine accepted. And so he became a Christian and he converted the whole church, the whole nation, the whole empire to Christianity. And this fundamentally changed what it meant to be the church. Now, instead of joining the church through your baptism, your discipleship, your confession and your community, now you're a member of the church because of your citizenship in this empire. So in the fifth century, we have a challenge, which is we have these theologians who have to figure out what do we do with this heresy? Do we rebuke it or do we collude with it? 
Do we speak truth to it or do we saddle up to it? And so Augustine begins writing a just war theory. The just war theory serves two purposes. A, it helps a Christian empire, which is a heresy, fight its wars more justly. And B, it justifies how Christian citizens of this Christian empire can now go off and kill in the name of God and country because a plain text reading of Jesus' teaching doesn't allow that. So I use the fact that we have a just war theory as evidence that the theologians of the day didn't choose to speak prophetically to this heresy. They chose to collude with it. But I was looking for where he went off the rails, right? Because whenever you go off the rails with Jesus, he kind of rebukes you. You know, he calls out, he calls Peter Satan. He rebukes James and John. You know, like, I'm like, where would he rebuke Augustine? I read through the just war theory. I read through the two kingdoms. I read through all these writings. And I couldn't figure out where he went off the rails. And I found this book in, in his, towards the end of his life, he wrote um, a book called On the Correction of the Donatists. And he's dealing with heretics here. And in chapter five, he's wrestling with the question, what do we do? What's the role of a Christian king in a Christian empire? This is a new phenomenon. We've always, been the, the, we've always been without power. Now we have a Christian king and a Christian empire. What's the role? And he argues that the role is to, is to serve the Lord with, um, by preventing and chastising with religious severity all those acts which are done in opposition to the commands of the Lord. He serves the king. He serves him by enforcing with suitable rigor such laws as ordain what is righteous, and he punishes what is the reverse. In chapter 6, he argues that it's better that men come to worship God through sound teaching than be driven into it by fear and pain. But many have found advantage, he said, in first being compelled by fear and pain so that later they might respond to sound teaching. So he's arguing the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to use the resources of the state to invoke fear, punishment, and pain to compel people to worship God and obey the commands of the church. If Jesus didn't have a problem calling St. Peter Satan, he would not hesitate for a moment to call St. Augustine Satan. What are you thinking? You're not on the side of God, but of men. This, of course, leads into the thinking of what we call the crusade, which is about expanding the Christian empire as well as protecting Jerusalem. And now in the 13th century, we have another theologian. This is Thomas Aquinas, who's also wrestling with the heretics. And he concludes that if the secular authority has the right to kill people who break men's laws, how much more authority does the church have to kill people who break God's laws? He says it's a much graver matter to corrupt the faith which quickens the soul than to forge money which supports temporal life. Wherefore, if forgers of money and other evildoers are forthwith condemned to death by the secular authority, how much more reason is there for heretics, as soon as they are convicted of heresy, to not only be excommunicated, but even put to death? So he's arguing the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to kill people who don't obey the commands of the church. In the third century, we also have... We also have... Um, the church begins defining a new category of other called the infidels. This is a subhuman category. It's first supplied to the Moors or to the Muslims, later supplied to indigenous peoples, anyone who doesn't worship the God of the white European Christian male. Now that we have this category of other, the subhuman category, now we don't even need a just war theory anymore. Now we can go to war based on our theological grounds. We're fighting the other. We're fighting the enemies of Christ. And it's out of this in 1452 that Pope Nicholas V writes out these words, invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit. This papal bull, along with other papal bulls written between 1452 and 1493, collectively become known as what we call the Doctrine of Discovery. Doctrine of Discovery is essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and the land is yours for the taking. This is literally the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa, colonize the continent and enslave the people. They didn't think they were human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in this new world already inhabited by millions 
and claim to have discovered it. You can't discover lands already inhabited. If you don't believe me, leave your cell phones, your car keys, your laptops out. I'll come by and discover them. <laughs> it's not discovery, right? It's stealing. It's conquering. It's colonizing. The fact that to this day we have monuments to Columbus as the discoverer of America reveals the implicit racial bias of the nation, which is that indigenous peoples and people of color are not fully human. This makes the doctrine of discovery a systemically white supremacist, and my clicker is not working anymore. The doctrine of discovery is a white male Christian supremacist doctrine that is the fruit of a church that has prostituted itself out to the empire. Now, initially, the Protestant church pushed back against this doctrine. This was a Catholic doctrine. They didn't fully buy into it. But in 1630, John Winthrop was in the, what's now called the Boston Harbor. He was with a group of colonists here to plant the Boston colony. And he preached a sermon called A Model of Christian Charity. In his sermon, he referred to the colonists as a city upon a hill. He's borrowing from the language of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, telling his disciples to be a lamp on a stand, a city on a hill, shining their good deeds into this dark world. He then goes on to exhort them in all patience, gentleness, and liberality. They should rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. They should keep the unity of the spirits and the bonds of peace. Just your basic Christian exhortations. End of the sermon, he's trying to convinced them to obey his exhortations. And so he starts quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 30 is the passage in the Old Testament where the people of Israel are standing at the banks of the Jordan River, ready to cross over and take possession of their promised lands. And God's reiterating the threats and promises of his land covenant. If you disobey me, I'll do these things to you. If you obey me, I'll do these things for you. End of this passage, it says, but if our hearts shall turn away so that we will not obey and worship other gods, we will surely perish out of the good land whether we cross over this river to possess it. Now, Deuteronomy 30 says river, but in his sermon, John Winthrop changes river to vast sea. And it's again... Changes river to vast sea. Now, why does he do that? Well, because they didn't cross the river, they crossed an ocean. So what's he implying? Based on the exhortations of Jesus to be a city on a hill, based on the model of Old Testament Israel, they are standing at the banks of their promised land, ready to go and take possession of them. I call this sermon the birth of American exceptionalism. This idea percolates for about a hundred years. In the early 1700s, mid 1700s, we go past the Mississippi River, we go past the Appalachian Mountains as we're moving further and further west. End of the 1700s, the Second Great Awakening occurs. There's a growth in churches, a renewal of denominations. Early 1800s, this term manifest destiny is coined. This belief that this nation has the God-given right to rule these lands from sea to shining sea. Now, why is this promised land narrative so dangerous? Well, if you read the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Joshua, how is Israel told to take possession of their promised land? What are they to do to the Canaanites? Kill everybody. However, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them. Promised lands for one people is literally God-ordained genocide for another. So we have this growth, westward expansion, second great awakening, manifest destiny. And you're thinking, well, yeah, but that was in the 1840s. We don't believe that anymore. So my co-author is named Sing Chan Ra. He wrote a book called Prophetic Lament. In his book, he compares lament to like being at a funeral dirge. You have a dead body in the casket. It's not going to come back to life. You go there to weep. 
If you truly lament, you sit in the brokenness, you sit in the pain, you need some kind of hope, right? So when we call the church to lament over the sin of racism and sexism and slavery and genocide, the church is going to look for some hope, right? It needs something. And most of the church is going to find their hope in the book of 2 Chronicles, which says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and what? I will heal their land. Somehow that got missed. We forget. We're not God's chosen people as Americans. And we don't have a land covenant with the God of Abraham. This is a promise God gave at the dedication of the temple. That was the old barometer. We have a new barometer. Nothing about prosperity, nothing about lands. It's persecution. Four years ago, three years ago, the Evangelical Immigration Table, a group of progressive Christian organizations were lobbying for comprehensive and just immigration reform. And in their lobbying, they brought together 40 verses that they said displayed God's heart for the immigrant, for the foreigner. One of their verses they chose was Jeremiah 7, verses 5, 6, and 7. Jeremiah 7, 5, and 6 say, if you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm. Now, these are all good commands. Obey them. But verse 7 says, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. I went to the evangelical immigration table and said, you can't use this verse. You don't have a land covenant with the God of Abraham. Yes, obey the commands. There is nothing in scripture that says, if you do these things, God will bless you here. It's not just a spiritual thing. This is a political thing. Three years ago, Benjamin Netanyahu was here in the U.S. He was lobbying against the Iran nuclear deal. He was invited to speak to a joint session of Congress. Congress was very divided, very partisan. They couldn't even talk to each other. He had to find a way to thread the needle to get everyone on the same side. So early in his speech, he hit on one of the most unifying topics in American politics, which is American exceptionalism. And he told our Congress, because America and Israel, we share a common destiny, the destiny of promised lands. If you're wondering why there was such a bipartisan rebuke to Congresswoman Omar last week when she dared critique Israel, it's because the United States of America has a very dysfunctional, codependent relationship with the modern nation state of Israel that has nothing to do with equality, nothing to do with freedom, and nothing to do with justice. We need Israel's Old Testament legacy of promised lands to justify what we did to African Americans and to Native Americans. And Israel needs our flourishing as a nation with a manifest destiny to justify what they're doing to Palestinians and Bedouins. We have a dysfunctional, codependent relationship with the modern nation state of Israel that has nothing to do with freedom and justice. It's about justifying oppression and even genocide. In 2017, there was a very bloody terrorist attack in London. And on the day of that attack, um, Congressman Clay Higgins, who is the representative from the 3rd District of Louisiana, his website identifies him as a Christian known for his refreshing focus on the, to focus on the power of the individual to be redeemed. On the day of this terrorist attack, he wrote this on his public Facebook page. The free world, all of Christendom, is at war with Islamic horror. 
Not one penny of American treasure should be granted to any nation that harbors these heathen animals. Not a single radicalized Islamic suspect should be granted any measure of quarter. Their intended entry to the American homeland should be summarily denied. Every conceivable measure should be engaged to hunt them down, hunt them, identify them, and kill them, kill them all. For the sake of all that is good and righteous, kill them all. Clay Higgins, U.S. Congress, Louisiana's 3rd District, June 4, 2017. And Facebook didn't even take this down as hate speech. And he hits on the unifying theme. How is it that the Christians in this nation are unified? How do the Baptists and the Pentecostals and the Catholics and the Protestants and the Reforms get together? Is it because we're a part of a body of Christ? No, it's because we are Christendom. We are Christian empire. This is what unifies us. So this, I was a part of the Christian Reformed Church's Doctrine of Discovery Task Force. And the Christian Reformed Church has a very robust theology of the depravity of all humans, as well as a very robust theology that we are saved by our faith and not by our works. And in our report to them, we gave them a story of a boarding school survivor who came from a boarding school run by our church. Also, we gave them a story of a boarding school survivor from a BIA school. The board of trustees of the denomination pulled the story of our boarding school survivor from the report. And then on the day of discussion in the synod, they first of all acknowledged that the existing doctrine of discovery is a heresy and we reject and condemn it. It helped shape Western culture and led to great injustices. But then they, turned, they went into a 20-minute period of sharing about how great their boarding school was. And then they passed another resolution affirming their missionaries because they weren't acting out of the doctrine of discovery. They were acting out of the Great Commission. So what causes an entire denomination that is founded on the theology of the depravity of all humans and you're saved by faith and not by works, what causes them when confronted with multi-generational systemic corporate sin to not repent but to go to their works? It's because Jesus doesn't exist in the multi-generational systemic corporate space of the American church. Not just for the CRC, for all American churches. This is why our churches don't know what to do with these kind of sins. Because we don't know Christ at that level. Christ is an individual savior for someone who's committed a personal sin. He has no space to deal with multi-generational communal corporate sin. We've written Christ out of that level of ecclesiastical history. And we've inserted Constantine. And I will argue tomorrow that in America we've inserted Abraham Lincoln. And even though he was assassinated on Good Friday, his blood doesn't do squat for you. And he is actually one of the most genocidal presidents in our nation's history. But this is what we do. And so the role of the church What do we do? How do we deal with this sin? If you have two families that live side by side, a Christian family and a non-Christian family, and the Christian family is a, leaders in the church and they're, they're model citizens in the neighborhood, and the, the, the husband of this family, the Christian family, is sleeping with the wife of this family, and this family is having marriage problems because of the affair, and so they go to the church and they say to the church, we are having problems in our marriage, and the church says, we have this great counselor, he's an elder in our church, he's an outstanding citizen, and we want him to counsel you and it's the man who's committing the affair that man has nothing to say 
He cannot pray for them. He cannot exhort them. He cannot counsel them. He cannot even advise them. He has nothing to say. The only role that he has in the healing of the marriage next door is to get out of bed. Because the American church accepts the heresy of Christian empire and believes that we have promised lands and we have rejected the barometer of persecution and embraced the barometer of prosperity, we have no role in healing the racial divide of our country. Our only role as the church is to get out of bed. We need to get out of bed. I want to finish by reading one article that I wrote. It just takes a few minutes. This article I wrote for the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship last summer in the height of the, um, at the height of the uh, families being separated at our borders. And I want to, it's titled From Prophecy to Proverb, and I want to read this and end with this. After we read this, we're going to go into a time of reflection, and I want you just to reflect, not even how to repent right now, But just reflect on how have we, both individually and corporately, bought into the lie of Christian empire? Wise is the church that refuses to buy into the trappings of partisan politics. Remember, my brothers and sisters, Jesus did not come to create a Christian empire. He came to make disciples. He came to offer his body as a living sacrifice. He came to plant a church. When the church merely lobbies one political leader and protest the other, when for the sake of argument or political gain, the body of Christ turns a blind eye to one sin and magnifies another, we are not representing the headship of our body who is Christ. As vile and repulsive and urgent is the separation of families at our borders, it's not the first time. Indian removal, the slave trade, boarding schools, lynchings, Japanese internment camps, mass incarceration, the list of ways the United States government has worked to destroy the family structure of people of color throughout our history is as long as it is depressing. So let's stop pretending that President Trump is the God-ordained savior or the ultimate demise of our union. The same with President Obama. What our nation needs is not for Democrats to be better Democrats, nor do we need Republicans to simply be better Republicans. We don't even need our nation to be more Christian. My brothers and sisters, the United States of America is not, never has been, nor will it ever be Christian. Jesus did not come to create a Christian empire. He came to make disciples. He came to offer his body as a living sacrifice. He came to plant a church. And wise is the church that refuses to buy into the trappings of partisan politics. I agree with Kenneth Kunda, the former president of Zambia, who said what a nation needs more than anything else is not a Christian ruler in the palace, but a Christian prophet within earshot. We're going to go into a few moments of reflection right now to think about this heresy to think about how we've embraced this mythology this legacy of promised lands and this barometer of prosperity because we don't want to accept the cup of suffering that Jesus not only invites us to, but calls us to. This is how we will know when we are on the right track, when we are persecuted, when we are shamed, when we are rejected, when our own families turn their backs on us. That is what Jesus promised. 
And that is what we need to understand if we're going to be his followers. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be with you today. There's lots for us to absorb and, and take in and process. And so what I'd like us to do is uh, right at your tables, uh, whether you do it across the table, or whether you break up in groups of two or three, let's take about five or six minutes just to process with one another. And maybe one of the questions that you might want to uh, process very simply is, how is God coming to you right now? What's resonating? what's speaking in you, what's speaking to you. And so if you don't know the person next to you, just introduce yourself. Uh, and for the next five or six minutes, just how is God coming to you at this moment? But thank you, Mark. Mark.